Light worms. Disgusting, right? Nah, at this moment you're probably thinking, what the heck are light worms? And if you don't know, well, that's completely normal because it's my own term for, well, these things. Let's take a closer look at them. Light worms are what I call the knot of serpentine shapes that often come to infest images of star clusters. They are fundamentally artifacts that appear because star clusters may contain hundreds of thousands to half a million or more stars within a small region of space that is tens of thousands of light years away, simply too far away for most small telescopes to resolve clearly. The camera doesn't know quite what to do with them and so that haze gets resolved as these light worms. They give the illusion of dust and gas in globular clusters, but globular clusters are virtually dust and gas free. So light worms are artifacts that don't belong there. To illustrate, let's take a look at some star clusters that are perfectly portrayed by NASA. This is the great cluster in Hercules. And as you can see, no light worms. Instead, we have beautiful clarity of the individual stars and a luminescence created by the thick field or haze of the stars in the core of the star cluster. Here is another NASA image of NGC 362. Once again, we have a haze of luminescence created by the thick field of stars toward the core of the cluster, but no light worms. And this is NGC 6380, another beautiful star cluster with, as always, an increasingly bright haze of light toward the core, but once again, no light worms. NASA is able to avoid light worms by time spent imaging to build a good signal to noise ratio, using telescopes with large apertures for better resolution, and shooting in space which avoids atmospheric turbulence. What this means though is that light worms don't belong in star clusters. But if you go look at images to be found among astrophotographers on the internet on sites like Astrobin and elsewhere, you're going to find a lot of light worms. Which in my opinion is unfortunate because they aren't difficult to get rid of and today I'm going to show you how. So let's go exterminating. The technique I'm going to show you for getting rid of light worms is remarkably straightforward. But with some star clusters it's a little bit more difficult than others. To illustrate this technique I've picked the rose star cluster which has a somewhat more challenging background to clean up for reasons I'll get into in a little bit. As you can see I'm in PixInsight. I've just finished stacking data that I've shot of the rose star cluster and I have the luminosity, red, green, and blue channels all lined up together. And presently, I'm running Blur Exterminator on each of the channels, right now in the correct mode to make sure all the stars are nice and rounded out. Cleaning them up only takes a couple minutes, then I'm going to run Blur Exterminator in default mode to deconvolve the stars, which will also have the unfortunate side effect of further sharpening the undesirable light worms, but it's no big deal. We're going to clean them up later. On a side note, you might be wondering why I have not combined the RGB channels together and then just run Blur Exterminator on all three of them together. Though standard practice, it's often undesirable. To understand why, check out the video linked above. It only takes Blur Exterminator a couple minutes to run on all four plates. And then the next step is to run Starline on the RG and B channels to line them up with the Luminance channel. Once star alignment has worked its magic, I'm just going to shrink the original RGB images and the registered RGB images that star alignment produced because we don't need them anymore. Then open up the channel combination tool and have it combine the red, green, and blue registered images. Running a screen transfer function on the outcome RGB channel shows that the color is imbalanced, but that was expected, even normal. So image solver is run to plate solve the image and then spectrophotometric color calibration is run to get the colors into balance. All of that only takes about a minute. Now all the developing steps up to now have been pretty much standard procedure, at, at least for the way I go about doing things. And up until a moment ago, we were looking at the core of the star cluster using the screen transfer function. The screen transfer function tries to balance out the dimmest areas of a region with the brightest areas of a region, and generally it works well, but it tends to fail with star clusters by blowing out the cores. So star clusters need a manual adjustment. With star clusters, you have to be more subtle and stretch the histogram to show as much of the star cluster as possible, but I stop at the point that the stretch begins to blow out the core of the star cluster. As soon as I can no longer make out individual detail of the stars at the center of the core, I'm done stretching. And when stretching is done, noise exterminator is run on the histogram stretched image because the next step is a curves adjustment. And while a curves adjustment is just another form of highly specific histogram stretch, I find that consistently after the histogram is stretched, it's the best time to run the noise exterminator. Otherwise you just custom stretching noise as well as your desired image. 
And the next major step in the development of a star cluster is a carefully considered curves transformation. My goal is going to be to brighten the stars, especially the outer dimmer stars, as much as possible, but control the curve in the upper right quarter so that the core is not blown out, which is very easy to do. I almost always start on the luminance channel, get it adjusted, and then either adjust the individual color channels if the image looks like it needs it, or just adjust the saturation channel. In this case, I'm going to adjust the luminance channel first, and then saturation. This image was shot on a night of about a 70% full moon, so there is just a little bit of a gradient in it, but I'm going to deal with that last. I know some persons say deal with gradients first, but I have never met a gradient remover tool that I liked, to be frank, and I almost never adjust gradients first unless they are really severe and even then very hesitantly because every gradient tool I've seen, even the very best of them, in my opinion, they just remove too much information from the image. I generally find that in almost every case, there are better options to control gradients than a gradient removal tool. Anyway, I'll get the luminance channel adjusted here, then the saturation channel, and then I'm going to rinse and repeat the entire process separately on the luminance channel. Though, of course, I don't have to worry about adjusting saturation on the luminance channel. Now, it's the luminance channel that's really going to bring out and display those stars in the outer regions of the star cluster that really did not show up in the RGB adjustment. And that's because the luminance channel gathers light, you could say, a full f-stop more efficiently than the RGB channels combined. The luminance channel on a mono camera is very efficient at gathering information. So when I combine the luminance channel with the RGB channel, we're then going to get a full color image of the rose star cluster. However, it's a bit bright toward the core and I want to do a little more to bring out the outer region of the star cluster. So I'm going to adjust the curves a bit further. Now, I feel we have a well-balanced image. There's good color in the image and good luminosity and we have the stars showing very well. But if we take a good look at the core of this image, now you can see those light worms also really well, unfortunately. Now the light worms are the haze of countless stars that could not be resolved and atmospheric turbulence. And due to the fact that they are in part related to the haze of unresolved stars, some might say they belong in the image, but I beg to differ. I would like my star cluster images to resemble more those of NASA, which are not riddled with light worms. I want to capture the special luminous glow that is found within star clusters. And light worms really are more like an aberration of that glow. Also, globular star clusters are generally virtually gas-free. It's one of the mysteries of star clusters. How did they form? And because they are gas-free, it is believed that they are very old and formed maybe around the time of their host galaxies or the universe itself. But they are nearly gas-free, so having what appears to be whiffs and trails of a gas-like structure within a star cluster, it doesn't belong there. And that's one of the reasons that when I develop star clusters, I always get rid of the light worms. They just really don't belong in an image of a globular star cluster. So, now that the star cluster is developed, let's get around to the business of killing light worms. To do this, you first need to run a tool to remove stars. I use the Star Exterminator. Alright, a Star Exterminator will take a moment to run and then extract the star cluster from the background. Now you might, and very rightly, be thinking, why on earth would I run Star Exterminator on a star cluster? My target is the stars. But in this case, we're making Star Exterminator do the opposite job. We're not extracting stars, we are extracting light worms. And there they are. Look at those buggers. A whole writhing nest of them. Disgusting. So we're going to get rid of them, but we can't get rid of all of them. And here's why. Look at the core of this star cluster right here. There does appear to be something of a writhing mass in there, but at the very center, you can see tiny dots that represent stars. The core is so bright, yet the light so diffuse due to the density, the overwhelming density of the stars, that the star exterminator gets confused by, by the density of the stars. It doesn't know what is star and what is just light or luminous haze or background to extract. So I'm going to have to be careful with what is done with the very core of this star cluster when I get rid of the light worms. Now, to kill the light worms, we need to go to work in Affinity Photo. So I'm going to save both these images as a starless and a star tiff and then pop over to Affinity Photo, my favorite photo editor. In Affinity Photo, I've opened the background layer where the light worms are and the star layer. The bottom layer is the background layer where the light worms are and the above layer is the star layer. Following standard non-destructive photo editing procedure, I'm going to duplicate each of the layers, lock them and make them invisible. 
They'll serve as proofs in case I make a mistake and need to back up. I'll also apply a screen composite to the star layer so the stars will show on top of the background layer. Now in the background, I could just erase out the light worms, but their luminosity belongs there, so I need to preserve the luminosity. The luminosity is what gives a star cluster its very special glow due to the massive density of stars within one. So the way I'm going to get rid of the light worms is to add a Gaussian blur filter to the background layer, the starless layer. The Gaussian layer is opened within the starless layer so that the Gaussian blur only affects the starless layer. Then, with the stars visible, I'm going to drag the slider bar and turn the blur up until the worms have dissolved into a diffuse halo of brightness. But at nearly 9 pixels of blur, a problem becomes evident. Remember I told you there would be an issue with the core earlier on in the video, because Star Exterminator would have a hard time distinguishing between star structures in that very bright core and what was just background light. So the core itself cannot just be blurred with the rest of the star cluster. We need to bring back the sharpness of the center of the core so that the discrete stars there can once again stand out. This is easy to do. First, I'll select the Gaussian Blur layer, and then select the Paintbrush tool. I then set the Paintbrush tool for Mask, and select the black color, which tells it to create an Erase Mask. I will also set the flow of the Paintbrush for 20%, and the hardness to 0. This creates a soft paintbrush, and I can selectively and progressively erase out the Gaussian Blur from the core, bringing back the definition in those stars. With that transition done, I can continue adjusting the Gaussian blur. I want to increase it a little bit more to continue transforming the light worms into a halo or haze of light within the star cluster and make the star cluster look more natural, all the while getting rid of those light worm artifacts but diffusing the light so that the star cluster has an overall more natural and appropriate glow. In the end, 23.7 pixels of Gaussian blur does the trick. Now within the star cluster, thousands of discrete stars will show and we have good diffusion of the haze of light within the cluster. There are just a couple last things to deal with. There is just a little bit of a red-green gradient in the image, and I want to get rid of that. So I'm going to pop the image over into Graxpert and use the AI to quickly take care of that problem. I'm now operating on Graxpert. I'm not a fan of the implementation of Graxpert within PixInsight. I know it makes it a little bit more convenient to work with it in PixInsight, but I like the additional control I get by using the Graxpert interface. Now for a proper gradient removal to be done, any edges and imbalances have to be cropped out of the image. So I'm going to perform a crop first, it'll only take a moment, and when the crop is done, I will use Graxpert's excellent AI. I know I said I don't like gradient tools, and that is true as a rule, but this is a simple gradient, and Graxpert is working with a very bright target against a very dark background. So this is going to really be a piece of cake. There, that looks great. We have good color, and the gradient is entirely gone. Now, we'll pop over to my Astrobin channel, where I've uploaded a version of this star cluster with the lightworms. Now we can see in the uncleaned up version that there is a distant galaxy, IC4537, on the right of the image. And just left of middle center, there is a wisp that may be a bit of, perhaps, nebulous gas. And, unfortunately, the heavy Gaussian blur removed these structures from the image. Let's put them back in. This is not at all difficult to do in Affinity Photo. So I've dragged the cleaned up version of the image in and just labeled it as New Version. And now I'm going to drag in the old uncleaned up version of the star cluster into the image. And superimpose the old version over the new version. Now, the new version was cropped in Graxpert, so they won't perfectly align anymore. However, it's very easy to create a perfect manual alignment. I'm just going to set the composites or blend mode on the old version for contrast negate, and the new version will be able to be seen beneath the old version as if they were negatives in black and white, with full contrast difference making each stand out. Then we can zoom into the pixel right here and align the two images right down to the pixel. And in seconds, they are perfectly aligned. Voila, we're ready to get to work. I'm then going to change the compositor blend mode of the old version, the uncorrected version of the image, back to normal, so that once again the image is opaque. Then I'm going to zoom in and move to the location of the nebula structure, top left center, drag the old version of the image beneath the new version, and then make the new version of the image invisible by clicking the little dot on the right. Then, with the invisible layer selected and the erase tool clicked, and the hardness of the erase tool set to zero so it makes nice soft edges, and the flow set between 20 and about 30-35%, I'm just going to erase out the area of the new layer over that nebulous structure. And now, when I make the new layer visible again, 
The nebulous structure, which was not removed in the old version by a Gaussian blur layer, can show through the layers. Now we're going to pop over to the right side of the image and do the same thing to restore the galaxy back to the image. And once the galaxy is restored, I'll just widen the brush up a good bit, maybe two or three times the diameter, and give a quick brush all around it to create a nice soft transition between the space around the galaxy and the darker space from the newer image. Thus, the galaxy from the old image will show through, and the old image will blend naturally into the new image. And voila! The image is complete. Let's take a look at the finished version. Actually, let's compare and contrast the old versus the new version. Here's the old version with light worms. And here's the new version without light worms. Finally, here are the two versions side by side. And if you would like to compare higher resolutions of the old version with light worms versus the new version without the light worms, look in the description of this video for my Astrobin link. Now I know whether or not to allow the light worms is something of an aesthetic choice. Some of you may feel that you would rather have them there, and, and some, I'm sure, would rather choose to get rid of them. So, like every photography technique, see this as just another tool in your toolbox. If you were building a project, you wouldn't use every tool all the time. You'll use the tools that you need, depending on what you want the project to look like. That's all for now. If you enjoyed this video or you have thoughts or observations, please leave a comment below. And I sure wouldn't mind if you took a moment to hit those like and subscribe buttons. Now, have fun doing astrophotography and get out there and shoot the sky.